All right, good morning, guys, and you are listening to Soul Talk here on Saturday mornings. Thank you for tuning in. And I have Heather on the line from uh, Los Angeles. She's producing a a uh, documentary on uh, near-death experiences, but she has kind of an interesting um, uh, um, subject she's talking about with it. So we're going to be uh, uh, talking with her about her work and how she got started on that work. And so good morning, Heather. How are you? Good morning. I'm great. I just want to make that one correction. I'm actually in Portland, Oregon. Oh, I I think because I met you through uh, Lisa, I thought Los Angeles. <laughs> well, she's from Portland. Well, so when you when we were talking the other day, you've had an out of body experience, and um, so but that and that happened in the eighties, I believe, in the late eighties. Um, yes. Is that what got you started on this subject of studying, or how where did, where did this come from, or? Well, to tell you the truth, the way I stumbled across the near-death experiences was just in a long journey of uh, trying to find what's true for me. Right. Um, I, I've never been religious. Um, you know, as a child, friends would take me to church. My mom would try to take me to church. But it was just boring in a place that you had to be quiet, you know? <laughs> and um, when I turned, I was a troubled teen, and um, so I was just crazy and doing all kinds of stuff. But... Um, I was looking for my truth, and I came across, I think the first thing I came across was Edgar Casey, and I was reading that, and I, you know, it, it was it was a little bit, it was a taste, you know what I mean, right. like of truth or something, and I was fascinated with it, so I just kept reading more books, and I uh, got to the point where I was reading this out-of-body uh, book, and then basically at the end of the book, it kind of gave step-by-step instructions on how to do an out-of-body experience. And so I was like, well, I'm going to try it. <laughs> it sounded fascinating, you know, and ever since I was a child, that was the other thing is that I would always have these dreams where I would run and jump and fly over the city since I was a little small child. Always, always had, and it always felt really real. Even, even after that experience, I still had those dreams. I don't have them as much anymore for some reason, but, um, so I was trying, I was, 17 years old, and I'm sitting down with that book, and I'd read it, and I would do the steps. And the steps were basically, you relax, you lay down and relax, clear everything from your mind, and then you um, relax each joint of your body, starting with your toes, into your ankles, and so forth, all the way to your head. And then you uh, imagine a triangle of light above your head, and that that light, sort of like a, a laser, comes down on your body, and and you, you feel it going slowly down your body and back up, and then you imagine that it gets faster and faster and faster. So I had been trying this for like three three weeks, and um, one day when I was trying it, I was at the popcorn ceiling, and I was, this was sort of like a, a balloon bounces off the ceiling, sort of like that. I felt like that. I felt like I was like up at the popcorn ceiling, and I was like, what the heck? And then as soon as I made the... I didn't see my body or anything. I was because I was facing this. You know, um, as soon as I had the realization of what was going on, I went. I was back into my body, but I thought that I was struck by lightning because um, well, every, this makes sense to everyone that has had a near death experience. But I never understood it. I thought I had been struck by lightning. I for a while I disregarded what happened beforehand. I thought I had been struck by lightning while I was laying there, and because my whole body was vibrating with electricity so strong that I couldn't move like when your foot's asleep. And um, and so I just sat there paralyzed and and then eventually you know, my body came back to normal and I, it stuck with me and it basically freaked me out. And so I didn't do that again. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I never told anybody about it. My mother... It has mental illness, and it's like if I ever tell anybody something like that, they would start to think that I'm having symptoms of that or something. So I never told anybody about it until recently. I started realizing that it is pertinent to the near-death experience. You know? Yeah, I, I agree. And, and you know, I think we're we're not the only ones on the subject of uh, near-death experience and shared death experience and uh, out-of-body experiences. I think they go they go hand in hand with each other. So. Um, yeah, they're like cousins or something or just part of the whole part of the same thing. Well, so after that, um, 
I that didn't stop me in my spiritual journey at all. It just stopped me from attempting the near the out of body experience. And I think on a subconscious level, it 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 opened up a, another world, you know, because like I had this knowledge of what happened. And so um, I was, I ended up getting pregnant and married, and um, I was with my mother-in-law that I wasn't very fond of, and I was with my husband at the time, and we were wandering around this place where there was classes here in uh, Gresham, Oregon, close to Portland, and uh, it's called the Strawberry Shortcake Festival back then. And so I'm wandering around, and you get to do all these classes for free, like a little taste of each class. And I wandered into this room where trying to get away from my family, and inside of there was um, Dane Brinkley, Saved by the Light movie was playing, and I was just entranced. I immediately felt at home. It was like it was like my church. Like all of a sudden, I, I found my church or something, mm-hmm. and I was sitting there fascinated and like my whole body tingling and watching it, and I, uh, Wally Johnson um, was there talking, and he at the time, he must have been 70, years old, but he was talking about um, all this knowledge and the study of near death studies and this group um, called the International Association of near death Studies, and he said, anyone's welcome, and there were these little handouts about it, and I read the little handout, and I was like, oh, I'm going to that, oh, I'm going to that, and so this, must be, this is the early 90s, and um, and I did, I was felt so brave, I was like 22 or 23 years old, and um, I it didn't make any sense to anybody I knew, but I was like, I'm going to this. And I, and I didn't really tell anybody but my husband. And I went to it, and he was, like, suspicious of me. And I was, like, doing something, like, making an excuse or something. Um, okay. So I went to this thing, and I was like, I am at home, you know. I really enjoyed it. I just sat at the outer circle, and I listened to people tell their stories. And some people told scary stories. Right. There was a lady that was there that had a um, – did a – suicide and she was just trying to make sense of what happened to her because she wasn't trying to be here you know and she had to come back they told her you got to go back it's not your time you know and so that knowledge stayed with me I went to those groups for um several years but then you know my life took new turns and I got a divorce and so forth and I wasn't attending the groups and I got the newsletter and then um I moved on to additional things. I started reading about synchronicity, and I came across the Course in Miracles. And um, but I always, you know, had the knowledge of the near-death experience, and I always read more stories. I lost t- touch with that group. Um, but um, anytime somebody would have a death in the family or they were going to die, um, just on personal friends, I would tell them about the story of the near-death experience. Right. And it brings peace. It's transcendent. No. Yeah, definitely. So you that was back in the nineties. How and then so how did you get obviously it got you more curious after that, but how did you get to the point where you started to want to do this documentary and what inspired you? Okay, so I remarried and I um changed careers. I've been being an executive assistant working at the city and making pretty good money, but um, I wanted to be home with my children. I had two more children, and um, I quit my job. And uh, while during that time, I started writing a script. It's a concept that I had. It, well, it's not really spiritual or related to this, but kind of science fiction. And I worked on that script for several years, and, and then we ended up moving to Mexico for a few years. Meanwhile, I still, re- you know, keep reading these stories and, and learning about these things. But it, it hadn't dawned on me until just this year that I wanted to pursue it as a film. I just knew I wanted to be a filmmaker, and I wanted to tell my stories. And so um, I moved back from Mexico, and I started film school in 2009. And um, I'm about to graduate from film school, so I'm going to actually use one cut of this film as my senior thesis. But I'm making that. This is my first uh, documentary. I mean, I've also made several films and um, web series. I worked for NBC for a while this year, but I quit that because it just felt just like working for the city. Oh. <laughs> and then being really corporate. Yeah. You know, I had this, you know, this idea that I'm going to like 
it's going to be different, but it wasn't. It was all corporate policies and office politics. Right. And um, <clears throat> anyway, so here I am, and I was deciding, you know, what I had uh, several concepts of what I wanted to do for uh, for a senior thesis, but um, but then my friend said to me, you know, you're always talking about this near death experience. Why don't you do a film about near death experience? And so I was like, well, I, you know, I can't do a senior thesis about it. You know, this experience is too big. I couldn't just do a senior thesis. It's not, you know, how are you going to get all this, this story into 10 minutes? You can't do that. Right. It's not possible, you know? And I was like, well, I'm going to make a feature film. <laughs> and, it, and I still was on the fence. I mean, I have to tell you the truth. I was on the fence in September because that's, it's a feature film. You know, and I was like, well, where am I going to get the money? You know, how am I going to do this? Which, you know, how state works is like you're not supposed to question those things. You're just supposed to uh, step forward and let it come to you. Yeah. You know? And um, and so I was still on the fence. I was really stressed out of my mind. I was like, oh, my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? And I was like, and all of a sudden, I met three people in a week that had a near-death experience. I um, got, I ordered this book. On the day that I was, I had to make a decision. It was important. I made it that day. And um, I got to, I had ordered a book like 24 hours before, and, and there was a knock on the door. While I was sitting here, okay, actually, it went out. That's out of order. I was sitting on my computer, and a video started playing that I did not push, and I did not look it up. I don't know how it got on there, but it was about near-death experience, and it started playing all by itself. And I, I heard some music, and I thought it was like traffic outside, so I was like looking at the room, and I was like, what is that sound? And, and I was looking around and I was like, ooh, you know, humming. And, and I finally figured out a video started playing on my computer about near death experience. While the video was playing and I was in awe of that, somebody knocked on the door. I went to the door. There was the book I'd ordered less than 24 hours before about near death experiences. And then somebody called me on the phone and they said, Oh my, uh, uh, old friend of mine, she says, I was just talking to somebody and they said they had a near death experience that I'd never talked to her about the subject before. And I was, and like a, a few other little things that I can't recall at the moment happened. And I, and I finally, I was like, uh, feeling like there was spirits in the room or something. And I, I was like screaming out, okay, <laughs> I will do it. <laughs> I'm in <near> this experience. <laughs> like, I get the point. Okay. I get it. It's like, <laughs> They were kind of like, we need this story to be told, okay? <laughs> I was like, did they have to hit me on the head? And they were. They were, like, pounding me on the head. You know, every time I would, like, waver, like, because I felt like it was such a big story. And so then what happened was, and this is really, really interesting to me, but um, I just had this idea that, you know what? I know Wally Johnson that I met in the early 90s was in his 70s when I met him, but maybe he's still around. So I, you know, there's a chance. People live into their 90s. <laughs> My family doesn't. I mean, usually they don't, but, um, so I, <laughs> so I, um, I looked it up and he, I found a book and so I sent him an email and like 12 hours later, he had replied to my email, sent my email out to other people, and I got a phone call from Sandra Boyd, who's the first interview that I have in the movie, and um, and she 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 says, well, usually I wouldn't call from me, which is like really fast like this, but I feel like compelled to contact you. And I said, I was just again taken aback because that's what I felt like. I feel like I don't really have a choice, but I mean, I want to do it, of course, but I feel like I'm being led to do it. I have to tell this story. I'm, my skills I worked for um, for the last four years and my writing skills I worked for since I was a child and everything, my storytelling ability and everything, is, is coming and marrying this, the near-death experience, which is basically my truth, you know, mm -hmm. my, my explanation of, of the closest thing to God that I can, most uncomplicated, purest thing to God that, that I've ever heard of. You know, and and that's what I'm doing. I think that is one of the most wonderful stories I've heard in a while. I mean, that is incredible how uh, God just like or the universe, whatever you want to call it, just kind of gave you a nudge and said, well, more a little bit more than a nudge, kind of uh, said, listen, this is what you're going to do. And I really need you to do it and made it happen for you. How incredible is that? 
I'm yeah. excited. I mean, oh, actually, there's one more one more step that I uh, happened to be before I met Sandra Blue, and that was that I was talking to a um, a documentarian who's a mentor for me, and I went to her and I said, "Look, you know, I want to do this. I had proposed my idea." that I wanted to do to somebody, and they just kind of blew me off. They were like, whatever. So I went to a different person, a mentor, and I said, look, this is the film that I want to make. And she's like, well, Heather, why? Why do you want to make this film? And, and I, I didn't hesitate. I mean, I, I have a hundred reasons, and a thousand reasons probably why, but I said, I said, because there are people out there right now, they've had a near-death experience. They're among us. It's, it's between... Four and fifteen percent of our population is estimated to be that have had a near death experience, and they can't talk about it. They're holding this inside of themselves. They don't. Some people don't even know what happened to them, but they can't talk to their friends and they can't talk to their family. She goes, "Oh, I see. So, so that's really good because that means you're making a story about the human condition, and it, anything about the human condition is the right reason to make a documentary because that's what documentaries should be about." Wow. And I said. Yeah, and she said, you know what, but I think the way that you should focus on it is not just, just about the near-death experience, Heather. I think you should focus on what you're telling me, what happens after they have a near-death experience. And so I said, oh, and I was like, ding, 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 you're right, you know. And so that was when I had contacted um, Wally, and I was going back and forth explaining about the near-death experience, and I wanted to focus on afterwards. And I met with him, and I had coffee with him at uh, Sherry's, and sat there talking. He handed me this piece of paper from PMA Shotwater, who I know that you've interviewed. And it's a, a study that, uh, it's a, I guess you would call it maybe a white paper, it's called Near Death States, the Pattern of After Effects. And it basically contained in, in this document everything, like the research is done for me, you know, and everybody kept saying, you are so lucky, you're doing a documentary and all your research is already done. Yeah, that's incredible. <laughs> And and I was like, I just it just keeps falling in my hand. And like Wally personally knows PMH Atwater, they're friends. She stays at his house when she comes to town. And so it's like one by one, everything just just comes to me. And to tell you the truth, every single person that I meet that has knowledge of the near death experience, they tell me they want to do whatever they can to help me. Absolutely. Well, this is so necessary. I mean, I, I think you and I were talking about on the phone the other day. I and I and I, I knew a girl that died at 27 from a heart attack, came back because she all the only thing she could think about is leaving her daughter, and then a year later died of a heart attack again. But that whole year, all she concerned herself with is getting back to that place of love, and she couldn't. She couldn't. She was having trouble adapting, and I think that what you're saying is that what happens after the near death experience could ha you know, really help people uh, adapt to what they're experiencing um, after the near death experience. I think that's incredible. So I think one of the issues though, that I, I've seen in the stories that I've read and even to tell you the truth with what happened to me with the out of body experiences, I, you know, I want to get this out there and, and maybe it can get to people before they have a near-death experience. But the truth is, is when people have a near-death experience, they don't really understand what it is. Often they don't even investigate it at first yeah. because they don't understand what it was. They are not even coming to terms with it. They just kind of put it out of their mind. The world is so harsh in compared to where they were. And it's a shock to your system to come back from the immense peace and love uh, that it's beyond our ability to explain in words. I mean, how can you put words to to that experience? You know, it's it's not in words. It's it's beyond comprehension. But it's the most beautiful, loving, wonderful home that you could imagine. And then you have to come back into your body. That most often people who have had a near death experience, they have pain in their body, and so they come back to this world of pain. People that don't understand, you're trying to tell them, look, no, oh no. You know, it, this isn't what it's all about. They want to tell them. Nobody wants to listen. And as soon as they start to talk to, say, maybe a doctor or something, else, oh, well, sure, I have someone to talk to you, and they call the doctor person. And, um, um, you know, basically they learn really fast, don't talk about it. And so then they just go, well, you know, this is inaccessible here, and they put it out of their mind. So my hope 
is to somehow cross that barrier between people that are interested in finding, you know, a, a better truth and the people that are like, scared of learning more and just cross that barrier and have people look at this. And I'm trying to say, listen, you do not have to believe in the near-death experience. You just need to know about it. Absolutely. You know? Because it's, it's happening. It yep. is happening. That means every person that you see on the street, that person knows several people that have had a near-death experience, but those people don't talk about it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, I'm I'm actually, you know, it's interesting. I'm reading a book now um, called Mentoring the Near-Death Experiencer. It's by a, a lady named Carolyn Matthews. And she wanted to get out there, similar to what you're doing, but she wanted to get out there and create a program to help mentor the, ND, the person that had the NDE or the out-of-body experience to help them afterwards. And one of the facts that she put in there was um, that in 1991, they did, I think it's a Gallup poll on, 20 million people in America said that they'd had a near-death experience. And, and she, she even comes to say that, that that is probably not even close to the amount of people that have actually had it and just aren't speaking right. about it. And nowadays, it's getting even more um, out there, you know, where people are willing to talk about it and speak about it and get out there. So, I mean, now, now is the time. Now is the time to really help people. So. Now, what are some of the? Could you tell me about some of the interviews that you're going through? I mean, I know, I know you made you've uh, met some uh, um, some pretty cool people. You're gonna you're gonna be interviewing Atwater, and um, but you know some of the experiences and the, ex the experiences you've gone through, or if you've, you've heard, what, what can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, well, so far, well, here's the issue: is that I'm trying to get a more diverse. A group of interviews um, because my first interview was with Sandra Boy and she's a very attractive uh, woman with white, I guess her hair is not blonde, but it looks about blonde. And then there's Dr. Lisa Hood, who's a very attractive woman with blonde hair. And then there's uh, PMH Atwater. And I'm hoping to actually get some men that look, you know, different, a different demographic because I don't want to give a false impression that it only happens to a certain kind of people or only to women or you know, something like that. So really, I just have the three lined up so far. I'm in my fundraising stage right now. I'm getting some initial, trying to do an initial fundraising campaign through Kickstarter right now. Um, and then I'm going to go out for um, some grants. I'm going to start applying for grants and funding um, through the Hartley Foundation. Um, they, ha they actually sponsor... Um, development of spiritual films um i don't know you know i have to apply but um <clears throat> so really i don't have all of the interviews lined up but i'm going to go back up to the international association the science uh, group up there in seattle and i had just chatted with a few people up there and they said that they have a d diverse group but i need to um i'm still working on it i'm still in development while i'm in production <laughs> um i think that's how documentaries tend to go often because it's sort of like a you know it's it's, it's a work in progress now do they need to be kind of in your local area the males and the, or the, the demographic you're looking for obviously for or can you do them well uh, i'm trying to raise the funds right now that's the first part of the fundraising is to to pay for travel for PMH Atwater and um, Dr. Lisa Hurd. If I could raise more money, I can just fly people in. But Or in Seattle area, I can go I can take my crew to them. But, I mean, I have a crew of four people, and um, so it's kind of expensive to fly around. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm hoping. Now, here's the thing. is like endearth.org has this wonderful resource on resource on um, people that have had near-death experiences worldwide, translated from other languages and um, put onto the endurf.org website. And it's really, any of your listeners, I invite, I mean, not that it's not my website, but I invite that you go and check that out because they are constantly updating stories. I mean, if anybody ever doubts it, there's hundreds and hundreds of stories are just added constantly. People, people go to a database and add their story and then they, endurf.org, um, Dr. Long, Jeff Long, I think it is. Um, and make perhaps his sister or wife. I'm not sure how they're related, but they update these stories constantly on there. And there's a directory for the media. And it, you can go and look up your location. You can actually see who's in your area. 
and have had stories to read their stories. And uh, so what I did is I went on there and I, I found three full pages of people just in this area. And I went to org and I said, oh, I'd love to get in touch with these people. And they said that they wouldn't be able to help me till January. So we're going to see how that pans out in the next couple of weeks. Um, if, if not, you know, I am definitely actively looking for another, you know, a, a broader demographic because the, the truth is, is it doesn't matter, you know, whether you're male or female, what you look like, you know, any aspect, whether you can hear, whether you can see, it happens to everyone. People that are deaf, they can hear while they're, while they're out of body. Uh, people that are blind can see. You know? Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, kind of, it's actually kind of interesting you say that because the soul really doesn't have a physical, demo, you know, physical composite when it goes up to its near-death experience. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like when they go when they go up and have their near-death experience, they're 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 facing God, not with their physical body. But um, I was just saying because I know a few males that have had near-death experiences that live across the country, and I could recommend them to. Or for any listeners oh, out there that are listening. That would be great um, <laughs> if you wanted to send me anything about that. Definitely. Well, and then for any of the listeners, anybody that are listening, to, uh, we're going to give uh, Heather's contact information when um, when we're done. And then she, of course, is on Facebook. So you can um, definitely check her out there and and, uh, and contact her as well. So well, we'll, we'll bring up that subject. What is your website so they can contact you? I think it's um, well, right now I just have a blog and the the Facebook page, Surviving Death, a documentary. I haven't created the full website yet, but um, that's what I have. So on Facebook, it's called it's at Surviving Death Doc. Facebook slash Surviving Death Doc, okay. and that's a really good place to contact me because I update all, every single resource that I can come across. People can comment about their stories. A lot of people have been coming onto the page and they just say thank you. They're saying thank you for doing this. People I've never met before, I don't even know how they found it. And they just say, thank you. I died myself. You know, here's one I'm reading. I died and came back. God sent me back so I can tell my story. And another lady, hi, I just want to say hello. I myself have had the NDE. And it's like one after another. They just come on and they say that. And so I think it's a really good place. And I every single resource I come across, I put on there. Um, more, more recently, I came across the work of um, Dr. Stuart Hammeroff. Mm -hmm. Have you heard of him? That one I haven't heard of. Yeah. No. No. In Arizona. He's a scientist, and he, it sounds really like, I forgive this, but it sounds very like, duh, to people that know about your death experiences, but he's been doing this scientific research to basically explain to the, the doubters of it. Says near death experiences occur when the soul leaves the nervous system and enters the universe. Oh, wow. <laughs> but I mean, you know. But you know, that's okay perfect. because it's, it's, it's kind of like, you know, I, I went and saw a lecture with uh, Moody back in February and, and, and he was talking about the naysayers. And he said yeah. the naysayers call themselves skeptics. And he said the actual skeptic is the one that just looks for the truth. You know, they keep on digging and digging, looking for the truth. But he goes, really a skeptic is is you and I, we're looking for the truth. And we're not taking uh face value on something, we're digging deeper. And and so yeah. then he then he goes he goes even further to say that he's talking about the naysayers and that say that um you know near death experiences are caused by a lack of oxygen or whatever they're they say. And he says shared death experiences kind of make that um that that argument null and void because the, the the person that's actually living that had a shared death experience they're not suffering from a lack of oxygen to the brain <laughs> so you know and, and yes so. yes i was going to mention that the other day uh, when you were saying that you interviewed dr raymond Moody, that was exactly the same thing like I, when i was first talking about doing my documentary i was trying to get uh raymond moody because i i feel like that needs to be you know advertise because a lot of people go, oh, and all of a sudden like a light bulb goes off in their head. People that aren't even very familiar with it or only hear about, you know, that they don't, they only hear about the skeptics and they, they, you know, how people are. They prefer to believe the negative thing before the positive thing. It's just from a lot of people's nature is that way. You know, you can see a miracle and they go, oh, you know, it's a trick. And then they'd be like, yeah, you know, they just believe it first. 
mm-hmm. negative thing. So I, I say that about the shared death experience to them, and, they, and the light bulb goes off, and they go, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've said that to you about the shared death experience, too. The, they just look, some of them look at me and do the exact same thing they did. Even I had one that goes, I still don't believe it. And I'm like, uh-huh. <laughs> 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 and so, well, so uh, there's some really, uh, this is some uh, a really cool subject we're talking about here. And so what are some things, th- one of the things that the near-death experiencer has, uh, I've read a lot about, is they have trouble adapting in, in to life but then they also have tr- trouble understanding what their life purpose is because then when they a lot of them went up and came back to you know speak their story or whatever and they feel that there's a purpose and they're not really 100 percent sure what that is when they come back so have you are you going to be touching on that subject or have you been working um, i think definitely we will touch on that i mean Obvious, I think that's obviously is a, a major issue. That's kind of why few, everybody needs to learn about it be, before they have a near death experience because I think that could just save a lot of time when people come back and they're kind of like, um, I want to be there still. Like, why am I here? And then they, some people feel sort of ungrateful about it. Right. They don't, you know, inside them, they know the truth, but they're like, why should we come back? You know, and they're you know, like, God, what's up? You know, and, um, so, other people, you know, they're they they're completely confused and disoriented. Just like PMH Atwater's um, research that she has, she calls this integration phase, phases of near death experiences that they grow through, and it's uh, it's uh, mainly applied towards adult experiences because I guess there's a whole separate chart for ch- child experiencers. Um, usually, it takes you know children when it happens to them. Maybe they they can never figure out what happens in, until like 20 years later. Right. And they realize, oh my God, this thing happened to me and it was real. But, um, but for our adult experiencers, it, she has phase one, it's the first three years. And this, this phase, I've heard of people at first, um, coming back from their near, near death experience and just really living it exactly how you're supposed to in that moment. But it, it's rare. A lot of people still don't, they just feel basically out of touch with their life. Like they're one kind of, of person. Uh, you know, I've heard this with like Sandra Boyd and um, even Dr. Lisa Hurt. They were both very driven, driven people that were concerned about making money, making sales, you know, um, just the material things in life. And they have a near death experience, and all of a sudden their whole world is collapsed. Right. You know, they, they come back and they have to re learn what they want and what's good for them and what they're here for and what they're trying to do. And so I guess eh, I would say more often than not in the stories I've heard, I don't know about you, but in the first few years, it's, they're disoriented, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah. And um, even though they want to live their life a certain way, and they probably do with the people they are, it's overwhelming their sensitivities to electrical things are higher. They um, can sense uh, people's energies around them. They are psychic. They can see things, the divisions. I've heard that the division between dimensions is much seems much thinner. Than, and so it's just kind of chaotic for them at times and overwhelming. Um, but they still at the same time, according to PMH Atwater, they are, you know, she interviewed over 3,000 people on the subject. And um, she, you know, she says that they have a hunger to learn more, but they basically kind of, they weren't adults, but they kind of act childish. Um, they have a heightened sense of what happened to them. Maybe they have IQ enhancements. I mean, there's all kinds of things that happen. So the next phase she, she puts is um, the next four years after work, after that. And that's when people are basically not in their, they're trying to come out of their own world where they're sort of consumed by everything about what happened with them and they're trying to reconnect with people and put their relationships back together. You know, I don't know if you've heard this, but a lot of people, once they have a near-death experience, they change everything in their life. Have you heard that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've heard that. Well, and uh, the, one of the one of the interesting things I found about the near, a lot of the near death experiences, the ones that talked about it, especially, their whole world changed. Well, in in some cases, they describe it as collapsed. 
<laughs> you know? yeah. And so, I mean, um, that's, I've found that pretty consistent. I mean, even in my own experience with the shared death experience I had, I, um, I'm around people that talk about this kind of stuff all the time. And that's, that's, that's the people that are around me in my life. And I have a hard time explaining it to them. And, uh, even though I, I, I do it, um, but unless somebody's had an out of body experience or a shared death experience or a near death experience, it's hard to explain the feeling to them because unless you experience it, they just don't get it. And I don't know if you've run across that experience from your out of body experience and this stuff, you know, the stuff you're seeing. You know, I I have this quality about me that um, some people admire, but I think it's sort of a weakness, and that's a lot of times I say my truth, and I don't really care what people say. Absolutely. <laughs> and I don't think that's, it's not very considerate, but I personally I haven't, I don't, I can't let other people believe, I mean, I'm already an empath anyway, and if, mm-hmm. if I don't stick strong to to what is my truth and what's in my core, and I listen to what other people think, I would just be a terrible mess. That would make you sick. That would make you sick. And that's why I tell people how I feel and what I say. But I'm sure that for a long time you might not have done that because I, I didn't do it for a long time and I was sick. <laughs> so, but I, I'm just, yeah. you know, there's a lot of people out there that aren't speaking this. You know, one of the gentlemen I interviewed not long ago, he, um, he had his near-death experience in the 70s, and he didn't really start talking about it until the late 90s. And it wasn't until he, and he's a student of, of Atwater, and um, until he ran across that research and met her, he, he you know, really didn't talk about it. And I think that that's the key thing right here is that, you know, we're starting to change with what you and I are even doing right here. We're starting to change people's viewpoints because, you know, we're not only talking about it when speaking about it, but we're we're bringing it to their consciousness. I guess is the best word to put it. And exactly. That's that's exactly the point right there. Like the more that I learn, the more I realize that even by putting these stories out there, if somebody doesn't never really came to terms or terms or didn't really think about what it was that they experienced or somehow they put it out of their mind or they blocked it. I think that often happens. People put it out of their mind or they block it or they just don't go back to it. You know, perhaps the accident itself was very traumatic, you know, and they just, they block the whole thing out of their their mind and they don't even come back to it till later. And and sometimes there'll be, I think, some subtle changes in their life where they're going to be, you know, there's things that happen physiologically when people have a near-death experience. Again, that's, the electrical sensitivities, the ability to see, um, sometimes people can see spirits or just sense things or be psychic, you know, but um, other times people just block it out of their, their mind. And I've been hearing this story where the people don't really acknowledge what happened to them until 20 years later. And I have to tell you the truth is that I didn't talk about my out-of-body experience either because, well, I didn't have the the need the odd experience, I just touched, I just bounced off the ceiling. I felt like I wasn't worthy. You know, I felt like, well, mine doesn't count. I never talked about it until recently. I just, I felt like I wanted to hear other people's stories because that was so beautiful and mine was just so benign. And um, so, again, uh, with talking about whether people... I mean, if we get this out there and raise it in the consciousness, I think if people know about it first, it would definitely maybe help someone recognize what happened to them. Yeah. You know? Yeah, well, and that's kind of thing. In my idea, um, back in the 80s, um, to me, anything in this realm, I would have just thought of, um, you know, Dionne Warwick and our psychic friends hotline. I wouldn't have thought of, you know, that this is, not saying that that wasn't real, but to me it was just for show. It wasn't anything that I needed to take seriously. And then even even though my, my mother was a hospice nurse and saw, you know, people's souls stand up out of their bodies <laughs> and all that stuff, and a ton of my friends were near-death experiencers, um, I I couldn't really understand it until I experienced it. I, I kind of understand where people are out there, and they, they may say it a little bit because they haven't, they haven't had the experience, and I understand the people that don't talk about it because then when they bring it up, even if the people don't tell them that, that what they're thinking is not right, 
they really don't acknowledge it with anything because they can't they can't really relate you know and so I, I, I understand what's happening and and I that's why I, I think we're doing doing a lot of good work here so um well so tell me a little bit um so you're you're it kind of sounds like you're at the beginning of beginnings of this project um that you've done some interviews and stuff but you know you're uh, uh when do you expect the release of a uh, of your film to come out Okay, so the short version will be out in June, but I'm actually thinking I'm still going to film for the entire year of 2013 because I I have really high production value on this, and I want it to be, uh, it's, it's in a way, it's going to be stylized. Um, you can kind of get, I'll send you a link to the, the video of what it's proposing just so you can get an idea that it's on the Kickstarter. I haven't actually launched the Kickstarter yet, but it's all prepared. And um, I want it to be really high quality because I want to go as far as I can with it. I want to get it out there. I want people to watch it. You know, I don't want somebody to not watch it because it is in high production value. I mean, there are people out there. When you're a film student, you get so snobby about film quality. (laughs) But (laughs) anyway, I mean, the truth is a lot of people will watch movies even if shot on your cell phone. But... But um, I just really want it to be high, high quality, and I'm, I've got some really good crew to work with, and um, I have a very specific look I'm going for. Uh, there's going to be an animation in the film in the very beginning of it. Just to explain really quick what a common near-death experience might be like, um, because, the, again, the focus of the film is not what is a near-death experience. It's about what happens to people afterwards. Yeah. And so um, the artist that's preparing the animation is insanely gifted. Um, and I, I talk a little bit about that in the video that I prepared. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking I'm at least going to do five interviews. Oh, I remember what I was going to say earlier. Um, all the people, if I'm not able to fly them in, I might try to do some Skype interviews with people because um, if the majority of the film is high production value, I could pop in like – a few pages are people that just say, like, you know, hi, I'm Joe. I died for 28 minutes, you know, and I had a near-death experience. And then uh, I'm Elizabeth. I, you know, I died for five minutes or whatever, you know. And just, like, because you can populate the whole screen with all of these people, and it might be really fascinating. The, the thing I want to get across um, to the public is that, it's common. Just, just shut up for a second. It's common. Stop trying to naysay it. It's happening everywhere. Ask around. Ask your friends. I was in a group one day, and I was. Um, it was a, a lecture, and it was a completely unrelated to this genre. And I just started saying, well, they're, they're like, well, well, what have you been up to? And I'm like, well, I'm working on this documentary uh, about near-death experiences. <clears throat> Do you know anybody who has had a near-death experience? And so. Figuring it's between four and fifteen percent of the population, according to Ian, I I started asking people, sort of doing like a own my own informal survey, and so I asked five people, and one of them knew somebody that had a near death experience. It was from others, right? You know, well, and these are just general people, just random people. It's everywhere. It's yeah. people walking on the streets, people sitting on the bus with you. It's people in traffic mm. around you. It's um, it's people in your office, the people at the mall, in the grocery store, those people all have had near-death experiences that they can't talk about it because the society looks at it as if it's something bad or, or crazy, and it, which doesn't make any sense at all because it's the most beautiful thing in most cases. It's not always the most beautiful thing. But in most cases, it's the most beautiful story you could ever imagine hearing. But just by hearing it, you, you become healed. It's like it heals you to hear the love and what is there waiting for us. You touched on a kind of a quick subject there real quick. What, because I know there are near-death experiences that aren't exactly pleasant. Um, what do you think causes that? Or do you have any, have you, when your research have you gotten? Well, I've been, you know, reading a lot of different stories about people and I read Enderf and, um, if people that are curious about this, again, I recommend you to go to Ender and read the constant stream of stories that come in there. And some of them are, I mean, everyone just tells their story, and they're not all wonderful. I, it's estimated, I have estimated that 20%, about 20% of near-death experiences, so 
not of all people that have, I mean, not of all people that, that there are, but just of the specifically to the near-death experiences are not the loving experience. Most people of those, of that group, they report of, of a, a void. But there are some people that report a negative experience. So it's true. And I didn't want to think about that. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I, when I first started hearing about these, I wanted, I'm the opposite of the naysayers. I only want to believe the good stuff. Yeah. Well, and I think it's a valid point, though, because those people, that, that they might have something that we need to uh, touch on to help them. And that's pretty traumatic in some cases, you know, that they go there and have a negative experience. It is, well, Here's my theory, okay, and it's not precise. It's completely imprecise. But I think probably a lot of the people that have the negative experience, they weren't being, they weren't living that life with integrity. Right. To start with, they mm-hmm. this happened to them, and they were um, being jerks. You know, they were not good to the people around them. They didn't treat people right. And um, and they went into this void. They didn't believe anything, and they went into this void. And they didn't, God didn't come to them. Nobody was there for them. Whatever belief system they had, nobody was there. They were in a void. And sometimes some people that have these actually report something scary. It's it's a much smaller percentage, but of the 20% that don't report this, you know, I'm not an expert on this, but in my learning, um, of the 20% that don't report experiencing that loving, feeling, uh, a, a certain percentage of those people actually experienced something that was scary, and sometimes it's because they did a suicide, and they took their own life, and that is forbidden, that's what I've heard, that's strictly forbidden, you're not supposed to do that. Right. I mean, we all hear about it in the law and everything, but like, I guess, according to God, you are not supposed to do it yourself, you're not supposed to... Even if you're a good person and you just take your own life, I guess you're not supposed to do that. Right. Well, I mean, that, 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 that's along the lines. I, that's along the lines of what I was thinking. I was thinking that a person that does that, they weren't living truthfully, or they weren't facing their demons in life. So it's very similar. So I, 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 I could relate to that. And um, you know, when they get over there, they experience what they felt inside themselves. So uh, in life, you know. Usually. Right. Oh, go ahead. Usually. What I've heard is that, um, this is again just taken from the reading I've done, um, is that the people that have the near-death experience, though, every person that has a near-death experience is changed afterwards, whether it's good or bad. But the people that have a negative, a negative one or a void, they become aware that there is something else and they somehow become aware that they do need to make a change in their life, usually, and they, and they, they do. And some people even have, I've heard stories of people that have one near-death experience and then later they have another near-death experience. And the second one is the one with the, the unconditional love. It is the one with the peace and the, the loving feeling. So the first one's kind of you a know. kick in the pants. <laughs> yeah, the first one's kind of like, get your stuff together, boy. You know? <laughs> So uh, with the last few minutes here, is there, is there anything that you would like to, um, to bring up that maybe we didn't cover? And um, just, you know, again, um, if you want to have anybody that's listening, if they would like to talk to me about possibly being interviewed, I mean, I can do some many interviews through Skype as well as formal interviews um, and um, have them email me at hkiersey at yahoo.com. It's H-K-I-E-R-S-E-Y at yahoo.com. But also check out the Facebook page. It's... Um, Surviving Death Doc on Facebook. I also have a blog and a Twitter. So, the Surviving Death Doc. Okay. And then for those of you guys that didn't get that, I'm going to be uh, providing that in the uh, comments of uh, the archive on YouTube. Um, so, you know, the show will be, you know, you've listed the show, but it'll be on the archive as well. So, it'll be there. And um, so, um, Heather, I've really thoroughly enjoyed uh, speaking with you, and I hope we speak again very, very soon, and we have you back on Soul Talk very, very soon as well. So, um, guys, thanks for listening, and uh, um, and I, I know we're going to be touching more on this subject with Heather later on, and uh, hearing about where she her project is at. So, thank you for listening to Soul Talk, and just bear with me one.